Hi, this is Garth Brown from Karen Crest Farm. Today I'm going to talk to you about land use and climate change. What got me thinking about this is a recent New Yorker article about veggie burgers. And the idea underlying this article was that it's absolutely necessary for us to transition from diets that include meat to diets that are almost or entirely vegetarian if we want to address global warming. So it was definitely slanted towards the veggie burger producers, and some of the claims were pretty crazy. I'm specifically thinking of the idea that four pounds of beef is equivalent in carbon emissions to a transatlantic flight. Nothing I've been able to find suggests this is remotely true. But the basic idea that uh, becoming more vegetarian in our dietary habits is necessary to addressing global warming is everywhere. And there's a really interesting part of this that is almost never addressed. When you think of the impact of cows or livestock on climate change, it's natural for most of us to think of methane or maybe the fuel burned to raise feed. But when you look at the actual models that underlie the claims of huge environmental impacts, it's mostly land use where livestock has its impact. So land is like a sponge. It can either absorb or release carbon. A great way to think of this is a forest. Trees are almost entirely carbon. The actual physical substance of wood is carbon that's been captured from the atmosphere and converted via photosynthesis into wood. It's pretty remarkable. And if you imagine a full acre of just tall trees, you get an idea of how much carbon could be stored in them. Uh, I've seen 100 tons, I think considerably more if it was the healthiest forest. By contrast, think of something like a cornfield. Corn is also mostly carbon, and it also grows very prolifically. But every year it's harvested to the ground, and often the ground is plowed, so there's really no long-term storage. You know, trees are building these huge trunks that get bigger and bigger every year. Corn is basically d taken down to bare dirt at the end of the season. So one idea is that by converting our diets from meat-based to ones that include no meat, we will be able to take some of the cropland and grow trees on it, which would definitely sequester atmospheric carbon. But what about animals raised only on grass, never fe fed grain, and moreover raised on grass that is grown on land not suitable for raising cash crops like corn or soy or these other annuals? My farm's a great example of this. I have a few acres that are flat enough to grow corn or soy, but almost all of it is too hilly to, for that, which really leaves me the options of growing grass or trees. And that raises the question, how does pasture or grassland stack up to corn or the forest that we were talking about a moment ago, as far as its ability to sequester carbon? And this is where things get a little bit complicated because there is no one answer to that question. If you came up here to central New York in the summer, I could take you around and show you some fields where they've put a bunch of cows out, uh, too many animals in too small a space, and they're overgrazing the grass, there's bare soil, and there's hardly anything growing. That situation, no more carbon is being sequestered than would happen in something like a cornfield. On the other hand, you can think of something like the tall grass prairies that used to cover much of North America. This was a hugely productive ecosystem, and though it's not quite as visible as a forest, it is capable of storing every bit as much carbon. First of all, just it, it's a really tremendous amount of mass in the grass itself, above ground and even more below ground in the root system. But there's a subtler way that that type of grassland ecosystem stores carbon, and that's through its interaction with grazing animals. So when you get a big herd of buffalo or properly managed cows and they go over and they eat the grass and they uh, produce manure, they use their hooves and trample the grass into the ground, all of that makes this decomposition cycle go incredibly rapidly. You can think of it almost like a mobile composting unit going around and taking this vegetative matter and turning it into high quality organic matter. And organic matter is nothing but a pretty stable form of carbon that does wonderful things for soil fertility, water infiltration, and the atmosphere. 
So the tricky thing when we're talking about grass is that management determines if it's good or bad for the atmosphere and the carbon cycle. And this is really overlooked in most discussions. It's usually assumed that farming, and particularly grazing, must be bad, so the only way to achieve an end like carbon sequestration is to take land that is currently being used for crop production or grazing and to grow trees or something else there instead. But what if we took a more nuanced approach? What if, instead of stopping farming, we did it in a way that benefited the atmosphere? The most obvious way to do this would be to improve grazing. There's no reason cows can't have the same effect on the land as buffalo do. I do need to mention that some people take this a little too far. I'm thinking of a video that was popular a couple years ago. Uh, it was Alan Savory talking about addressing climate change by managing grasslands better. And he seemed to be implying that we could reverse global warming by doing this. It's a wonderful idea. I hope it's true, but I haven't seen evidence that convinces me it's so. Climate change is a hugely complex issue, but it, when it comes to land use and agriculture, it's often been distorted and diminished into palatable lights of little inaccurate information. And I'm trying to be a little more nuanced here, but I'm only scratching the surface. I haven't touched on the intricacies of global trade, the fact that huge amounts of the grassland of, in the world are uh, supporting subsistence agriculture, so consumer changes in one part of the world might not have a desired impact on that in another. And there's also a lot of questions to be answered about the best agricultural practices if we want to farm in a way that sequesters carbon and is healthy for the whole ecosystem. So avoiding meat isn't a silver bullet, but neither is just buying grass-fed labeled meat. Building a healthy ecosystem cannot be accomplished with a single choice. It requires sustained conversation, effort, and attention, and it also requires, uh, on the part of people like me, a willingness to change, as the science suggests we should, or conversations with other farmers suggest we should, which isn't an easy thing to do, but it's important that we try. Winter has arrived on the farm. It's been an interesting start, because the big storms have been smaller than forecast. We had 20 inches called for one day and ended up with about 10, but in the small storms or non-storms have ended up being a lot bigger. There have been days when we've had no snow in the forecast and have ended up with five or six inches. Uh, this isn't totally unprecedented, but it's been happening a lot more than usual. The only downside is that we've gotten, on the whole, more snow than we usually do this time of year, and that made us start feeding hay to all of our animals a little earlier than we'd like. But over the past couple days, we've had enough rain to wash away most of the snow. So now the cows and sheep are back onto pasture, and we hope to keep them there through the first of the year at least. I've seen a couple rough-legged hawks, which I always love. It's a sign of winter because they summer up in the Arctic and then come down to balmy central New York to spend their winters. And they're really cool birds. They're a little bigger than a red-tailed hawk, which is uh, the one you're probably familiar with. And the remarkable thing they do is they actually will hover. So you'll look out over a field and there will be this giant bird hovering there looking for a vole or a mouse or something to eat. The farm's been a little less busy since Thanksgiving, but it's still a good time of year. We have some turkeys left if you're interested in a turkey. We have some nice loin roasts and some leg of lamb if you're looking for a holiday meal. I've gotten a lot of questions about butter and when we'll have that. I simply don't know, but I will certainly put it in the newsletter as soon as we do. That's all I've got to say for today. I'll see you next time. Bye.